Hello, and welcome to the Tengenspan Guide to Normal and Heroic Primal Council in the Vault of the Incarnates. This can be as early as the second boss, or as late as the fourth boss in the raid, and is a rare council fight in which all four bosses will be active for the entirety of the fight. They do not have a shared health pool and need to be killed at approximately the same time. Each boss has a major ability and one or two minor abilities, and we'll talk about the major abilities first. The first comes from Dethea Stormlash. Dethea marks several players with Conductive Mark. Conductive Mark does a decent amount of nature damage and puts a circle around the players. Anyone who enters those circles gains the debuff, and it can stack. Each stack also increases nature damage taken, so if you pass this around to your whole raid, or if two people hug it out and keep passing stacks back and forth, the damage adds up very quickly. The raid must therefore remain spread for most of the fight. Fortunately, this debuff can be cleared by interacting with the next major ability. Opal Fang casts Earthen Pillar, which causes pillars of rock to erupt out of the ground. If you have the Conductive Mark and you run it to the pillar, it grounds out the debuff and removes it from you. We tried stacking everyone on these pillars before the debuff went out, but the debuff was spread to other stacked players faster than it would ground out, so this is not a viable option and will not work. You'll need to keep your raid spread, and the members who get the debuff have to bring it to the pillar without running it over anyone else. If you are not targeted with the Conductive Mark, be a pal, give your teammates room to get by. On heroic difficulty, each pillar will pulse raid-wide AoE damage, so you don't want to have too many of them active at the same time. Fortunately, you can destroy them with the next major ability. Embar Firepath targets two players and hurls his Meteor Axes at them. These do massive damage split between everyone standing inside of them, so you need to have some people soak each axe. You also can and generally should use personal immunities to solo soak these if you have one when you're targeted. The axes also destroy any earthen pillars they hit and leave a large patch of fire on the ground. The fire is how you deal with the last major ability, which we'll talk about in a second. On heroic, the axes also debuff you, causing you to take more damage from the axes. This just makes it so you can't soak more than one of the circles each time. Kadros Ice Wrath casts Primal Blizzard. This blizzard sucks you towards Kadros. It does do damage, and it gives you a stacking debuff. If you do nothing during this cast and reach 10 stacks, you'll be frozen in a frost tomb, and your raid will have to attack the tomb to get you out. If, however, you briefly step into a patch of fire during the cast, it'll reset your stacks and you won't get frozen. The most difficult part of this fight was when Primal Blizzard overlaps with the conductive marks going out. The suck makes it more likely for players to spread the debuff, and the resulting chaos could cause you to forget to clear the frost stacks. As far as less impactful abilities, Kadro and Dethea spam interruptible casts that do damage to random raid members. They should generally be interrupted whenever possible to reduce raid damage, and specifically interrupted when the bosses need to be moved. Dethea also casts Chain Lightning, which just does unavoidable raid-wide damage. For tanks to worry about, Imbar uses Slashing Blaze, which is a frontal cone that's supposed to do stacking damage to everyone hit, and Opal Fang crushes his target, causing large damage and increasing all physical damage taken by 100%. Tanks need to have a defensive up for their second stack of crush, and Town Swap both bosses at two stacks of crush. As each boss dies, they start pulsating unavoidable raid-wide damage. A few ticks of these can be healed through, but if the bosses don't die just about the same time, their damage will quickly get out of hand. Alright man, so what did we think of the fight? I think all in all, I think it's the best way to do a council style fight with all four bosses active at the same time, and also their abilities kind of interacting with each other. I do think they fell back a little bit too much on the clear your debuff with something on the floor idea because two of the bosses cast something that goes on the floor or comes up from the ground, and then two of the bosses cast something, either a debuff on you or something that's giving you a debuff that you have to go and stand next to or you know, on the fire or next to the pillar in order to clear it. That's true. There is kind of an interesting take on it, though, with the conductive mark and the fact that if you run two players over each other, it'll just keep going back and forth and you'll get a ton of damage. That really makes it important that when those marks go out, players have a safe path to a spike and kind of making sure that like the player are spread, but that you're also able to get a path for everyone to a spike it kind of adds an interesting flair to it. It was very frustrating the first couple times that you tried it, but after that, I think it, it became a more interesting mechanic of the fight to me. 
Yeah, and that is something you can pre-plan if you're the type of raid leader that likes to have, you know, rule with the iron fist type. Make sure that everyone is walking the way that you need them to. You can have sort of a path in to clear and a path out to clear and really run things that way. Or you can kind of YOLO it and just say, hey, keep your head on a swivel. Make sure you're not in the way of people trying to clear their debuffs. As far as tanking goes, the most the time you're taking the highest damage is definitely right after you take the second crush from Opal thing. Um, you're taking 200% increased damage and your melees are hitting like a truck. Um, at the same time, you'll sometimes have marks going out at right then and Blizzard coming out. And you might also have the slash debuff. So try to keep in mind to save some of those big cooldowns for after or right at that second crush and then the period right afterwards. Because that's when you're going to be taking the highest amounts of damage. Yeah, I did die on the Paladin a couple times during testing, like right at those moments where you just get a huge overlap, especially for the tank. Which is kind of odd to see that situation. You don't see that too often where the, the tank has so much overlapping him that he's taking so much damage from, from different sources. Yeah, the, the fire debuff from Embar wasn't stacking the way that it's supposed to, so that was a more consistent damage on in the raid. I don't know if that's if that's something they'll get fixed or not. Um, but that was kind of less of a factor. If that becomes tuned better and it properly stacks, and it would be very important to make sure that that's one of those frontals that's faced away from your co-tank, which is just, this fight gets a little hectic when you start having to move for the marks, move for the fire, move for the blizzard, um, and then move out of, out of other mechanics. So making sure that that's aimed the correct way so that you're not clipping anybody, especially your other tank, becomes really important. I would also recommend setting up an interrupt rotation on the ads. Um, if you have the interrupts for it, shamans will be great, I'm sure, for it. The, a lot of casts going off, then at, from a tanking perspective, when you're trying to move the bosses, you really only have control over the two. The other two need to be interrupted in order to move them. So there's some, some classes, you know, Paladin has to throw out shields and do a lot of interrupting that way. But sometimes you're relying on your DPS to sort of help them move the boss for you. Um, and some of the moves can be pretty big when you have fire um, and pillars coming out right about the same time. Um, it's just you're going to be moving quite a bit. At least I, I think that's the best way to do the fight is to keep your raid stacked up kind of behind the boss and make sure all the abilities go up behind. So kind of like you do on Aranog where you want the puddles to be behind the boss. You want your, your fire, your earth to be behind the boss. Then you pull them out of the way and then let the raid kind of deal with the mechanics as you, as you pull the boss into a safe area. And this will be a much looser stack, so kind of in the general area behind the bosses, but you will need to be spread at least, I think it's three yards with the conductive mark, so it can't be everyone just stacked on one point. Yeah, I personally like tanking the bosses towards maybe the edge of the room and then having most of the raid towards the middle and sort of pivot around the middle as, as you're dropping mechanics. And it, the fight really is kind of a, a flow. Once you've done it a few times, you'll start to see the flow between, you know, or, all right, the pillars are out, connected marks are out, go clear those, then the fire comes out. After the fire's out, the blizzard comes out. You kind of get the flow pretty pretty quick. So this is one of the earlier bosses, so it's not going to be one of the hardest bosses you face. So it, it'll be one that goes pretty quick. That being said, during testing on normal difficulty, we actually had some issues, I think, because of the overlaps. Now, we were, we were pugging quite a bit, too. Um, but it seemed tuned up quite a bit, at least on the normal difficulty. Uh, we did have a different group in for Heroic, and we didn't really struggle much with it. I'm not sure if they either amped it up a little bit from Heroic to normal testing, or if that's just kind of a byproduct of tuning being a little bit all over the place for that one. We also had a smaller group size for normal, um, which on normal you can, act, you can actually stack the, the axes when they go out, so you can have two people soaking those. So that... The, the soaks there kind of got a little bit iffy, I think, sometimes with on with a smaller raid size. So not, that might be something to consider if you're struggling is increasing your raid size a little bit. Um, what did you think about the aesthetics of the room and the fight as a whole? Uh, it looked a lot like a lot of the other rooms and at least a lot of the other boss rooms in this raid, right? Taros is just a, a big circular room with a big boss in the middle. This had the same kind of feel, just a circular room with lava around the outside. It was cool. You could kind of run up on the sides, though, a little bit. There's no reason to during the fight, but you could kind of explore the outer edges of the, of the circle, I guess, and do some climbing if you want. Yeah, the, the room itself felt a little lazy to me, and I, and I get it, because they are really exploring the elements as the theme of the dungeon here, and there's only so many different ways you can do fire, rock, earth, and, and lightning, storm, whatever you want to call it, but it definitely felt 
pretty much the exact same as the Taros encounter as far as what the room looked like. I wasn't particularly impressed, but I guess it's a little hard. It wasn't their top priority on this fight, I guess. That's all we have for this one. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Please like and subscribe if you can, and we'll see you in the next guide.